<coughs> moderating. So very happy to be here. Uh, the reason is unfortunately not that happy. Yeah, we have been now 11 months into the war, which Vladimir Putin has started. Uh, the war doesn't seem to come to an end soon, unfortunately. Uh, and the war that, of course, has dramatically changed millions of lives in Ukraine, but also in Russia. Like a million and a half Russians went into exile, like as political uh, immigrants or dodging the draft, just don't feel to um, participate in any like Putin's activities. Some would say that's a lot. Some would say that's not too much. Some would say, why is they not staying within the country and, and fighting against the regime? Uh, this discussion, as if Putin's war or Russia's war, uh, goes on for like 11 months. And I believe it's very important for us also because it kind of like defines, it will define Russia after the war and Russia after Putin. There are many questions of like, responsibility, liability. There are many questions of like, if something is like fundamentally wrong with Russia, if there is hope for a better future for Russia, if Russian society reacts like, to the world this way as it reacts, so very many questions and we as the Russian politicians have to find an answer. So just to bring anyone, everyone on the same page, so, I'm currently yeah, leading the Anti-Corruption Foundation that has been founded by Alexei Navalny in 2011. We are the largest Russian political opposition force. We are now operating from Vilnius and Lithuania, about 140 employees in our office uh, engaged in several large political projects, most notorious of them being our anti-corruption investigations, of course. That's how it all started. But uh, not limited to, we do international uh, advocacy for um, extended sanction policy against Putin's friends and cronies. Uh, we do uh, the international free Navalny campaign, of course, like to, to support and to help our founder and friend and boss, uh, Alexei Navalny, to get out of prison. We run a huge YouTube me, not only YouTube, multi-platform media operation uh, that we started on February 24th, 2022, which is, uh, well, dedicated to telling our Russian compatriots truth about the war, countering the propaganda, explaining what's going on, delivering uh, independent fact-check news and so on. Being not professional journalists, we saw like an enormous vacuum in the information space uh, because when Putin invaded Ukraine on February 24th, he not only invaded Ukraine, he also shut down all independent media within Russia like on the same day. Uh, we felt it as our responsibility also right, to, to, to fill this gap. Mm, we went on to like broadcasting uh, different types of programming about the war. Now we're broadcasting between six and eight hours of content daily, reaching more than 15 million unique viewers every month. Uh, about like 200 million views and about 15 million, closer to 70 million unique viewers now. So it's quite a large uh, operation, actually. Uh, we also do a lot of polling. And this is something that I want to share, like to start our discussion with. Uh, polling in Russia and Autocracy has never been easy. And after the beginning of the war, it has become even more complicated. It's quite obvious that you can't just ask direct questions. Like, do you support the war or not? That's not a valid question because the respondent perfectly knows that the liability for the wrong answer might be up to 15 years imprisonment. So we have to investigate, we have to study like public opinion using some indirect tools, and that's what we are trying to do. For instance, we've asked in a very recent poll, like 
a few months ago. <clears throat> we do monthly polls, uh, like random sample, uh, 1,000 uh, respondents, uh, gender and age uh, balance. Uh, we asked, uh, what do you think if the special military operation, as they call it in Russia, not the war, uh, is going according to the plan? 14% said yes. 86 had a different opinion. Some of them said no. Some of them said too early to call. I'd rather not talk about it. I don't know how to answer. It's too complicated. Or just I want to skip this question. And we, all, we always offer this opportunity. We don't want to force them to lie. Uh, if you want, if you feel this question is too sensitive, you can just skip it. Okay. I'm not saying that this 86% are all Navalny supporters or that they're all against Putin. Of course, they are not. But it is also quite clear that they are not buying the most important propaganda narrative anymore. And the most important propaganda narrative is like Putin has a plan for all of us. Putin has Putin knows what he's doing. He he has a plan, he has a vision. The situation is under his control. Okay. Despite by 24 by 7 brainwashing by state media, six out of seven Russians are not buying this anymore. Which means, which doesn't make them immediately like good people or like oppositions, which makes them open for a conversation. And this is very important in current circumstances. The first week, uh, the first week of October, so immediately after the mobilization, uh, the most Frequently asked question on Yandex, so the Russian Google, Russian national search engine, was when is the next presidential election? Which is uh, 15 years too late. They should have asked it in 2007, maybe, when it was still a chance to change something in the country for presidential election. We have to admit it's 15 years too late. But we also have to admit people are connecting the dots between the war, the mobilization, and politics. They understand like who is liable and that something is wrong also with the political system. Yes, too many people were politically asleep for too long, but as they are waking up even now, even if it's too late, we have to talk to them, we have to answer to their questions, we have to explain to them what's actually happening. And well, that's what we are doing, for instance, with our media operation, and that's what other independent Russian uh, media and politicians try to achieve. We don't believe these people are hopeless. We believe we need to talk to them and, and to explain and to make them change their mind. We also think that this is kind of like, well, our contribution into the international fight against Vladimir Putin. The war of 21st century, the war of 21st century is a complex phenomenon. It has many dimensions. The military one is, of course, the most important, by far the most important, but not the only one. So Ukrainian armed forces, uh, with the help of the whole world, are heroically resisting, resisting the aggression. But also there is a very important economic dimension, with the sanctions and uh, other tools that are being used to make it like for Putin unbearable to, to maintain his um, aggression. And also, of course, the political dimension, the information dimension, is also very important because, uh, yeah, they can't run a successful war without um, support, if when they lack support in the society, in the society. They actually already experienced very severe problems. The first wave of mobilization in October, they managed to uh, draft 300,000 people, while over a million left the country, and while pretty much zero volunteered to join the army. If we consider actually like the broader picture, if we put it a little bit in the historical context, it's remarkable to which extent Putin's propaganda failed its most important task the rally around the flag, the flag, the patriotic mobilization. From 2005, from the 60th anniversary of the great victory uh, and in the Second World War, uh, propaganda was given 
like villains to create a new national religion. This religion of victory made like this all uh, which I mean which is literal religion. Yeah, so the, the 9th of May, the Victory Day became by far the most important national holiday. Everything during the year was like about these days. They actually also erected an enormous temple of Russian armed forces with some of Hitler memorabilia in it, for God's sake. Uh, they uh, literally spent like 17 years explaining that there will be another war like, against the evil West, and we'll have to do what our grandfathers did. We have to repeat what, what their grandfathers achieved like in 1945. And then, well, the war is happening, and there is no patriotic mobilization, no rally around the flag, to that effect that they have to rely on felons, or that they have to go to like prisons and uh, draft uh, convicts from prisons to die in Ukraine. Uh, so we actually believe this really well makes sense to continue to talking to them. And I have to say at this point that there is a narrative that I particularly dislike, this narrative that I mean uh, Russia will never be able to be a democracy, that there is no chance that whatever happens in that country, it will always be like very aggressive and dangerous to its neighbors. And so on. like Russians are genetically unfit for democracy, as some people put it. We can't agree. Uh, we see how support declines for the war, how people try to find ways to express themselves. Yes, they are not rallying in large cities. Putin also is also not saying Putin is also not, send, not sending his riot police to front lines. He keeps it all in large cities. But actually, uh, protest activities of this or that kind are happening every day somewhere in Russia and quite frequently. 75 uh, conscription points were set on fire in the last few months, like since the beginning of mobilization, to name one type of activities, uh, and so on. So we, as a like Russian political political opposition, try our best to find ways to to connect to our supporters in the country, to expand and to use our existing supporters, which are millions of, as a media to reach out to their like friends and relatives and to talk. One last data point that I wanted to give is that not only 64% uh, told us they have someone, like friend or relative they know well, being mobilized, but also already 9% told us they know someone who died in Ukraine. So it is, it is definitely like having a huge impact on the society. It's not isolated. Putin didn't manage to sell like very important thing that he tried to sell initially, that you don't have to care. Life is as usual. This is a special military operation performed by specially trained people. So for you, like regular people, it doesn't mean anything. Your life is as usual, like not anymore. Mobilization was a huge shock for the society. Uh, people started to ask questions and it's remarkable to which extent Putin doesn't have answers for that. He had like plan A, which was to take over Kiev in 72 hours. This plan tends to go failed. And it became very clear that he doesn't have a plan B. And this silence is now really getting very loud. He canceled the annual press conference, which he didn't do for 20 years. He canceled the State of the Union speech, which he actually is as an obligation to do according to the constitution. Not that Putin gives them an about constitution, of course not. But it was actually, it is also a very clear sign that something is very wrong, that he doesn't have answers for the questions everyone's asking in the Russian elite, in the Russian society, 
among like the experts, among the generals, among the military, and so on. So he believes that like further working with the Russian society, mounting more and more pressure against Putin, asking this question will yeah lead to the point when uh, uh, he will yeah fail, fail being not able to uh, connect with the society in Russia again. Uh, I was expected to talk for a few minutes. <laughs> I took almost twenty. I apologize. Uh, uh, of course, let's jump over to Q and A as, as soon as possible for the discussion. Sorry, sorry Sam. No, nothing to apologize for. Certainly, a lot to uh, a lot to discuss and a lot in there to um, to pick up on. Um, I'm looking at this my screen down here at the moment. There is an audience out there in Zoom world as well. So I would invite anybody out there who has a question to uh, where's the camera to post that question um, to the chat, and then I will uh, try to collate them. In. And uh, and read them out. Anybody in the room who'd like to ask a question, put your hand up. There are microphones circulating, uh, so I would ask you just to introduce um, uh, introduce yourself. Um, I will, however, I'll call you first, but I do want to abuse the chair um, for a second and ask ask this question to pick up on some of the themes that you identified. Um, the first time I think we met uh, was 2018. I came by the campaign office in in, in Moscow um, and. We talked about uh, sort of the, the political watersheds in Russia um, and about the fact that it's even then it was hard to find anybody in Russia who actually thought that the country was well governed, right? That the real political difference was between people who understood that the country was well governed but thought that it had always been and would always be well governed and it really wouldn't change if somebody like Alexei Navalny came to power, right? And a group of people who believed that if somebody new came to power, that there could be a change in. In the quality of their lives, and that that was the task of you as a political opposition was to convince people of that. Um, is that are we dealing with the same kind of politics in Russia now, or is something fundamentally shifted? I believe something has really very much shifted. Uh, the world has, of course, become like very much black and white. Uh, there is there is barely any place for like staying. Uh, in a position like, okay, I mean, I don't like Putin, but there are some things he's like, okay, and it's like better for the country to like develop this way, like, uh, because everyone has seen where actually the development this way has, has led us. Uh, I had a meeting uh, today at the State Department, Matt Wendy Sherman, the Deputy Secretary of State, and they've asked like a very traditional question, they always ask. Like, should we tweet about our meeting? And they tweeted like 20 minutes ago. And we told, of course, yes. I mean, why not? It's it's a privilege. And so we thought, well, in the past, we would like have reservations. Maybe it will cause like harm to you. And they thought, I mean, indeed. When I used to live in Moscow, I was like every year invited to the like 4th of July, 4th of July, uh, so at the American embassy, and I would never go. Zelensky would go, Sergei Markov would go, all the like, patriots would go because, well, free booze and I mean, <laughs> but, but I would never go because, of course, this clearly would be used by, by, by the propaganda to explain, you know, say American politics and so on. This times has entirely changed because, like, um, now, yeah, everything's like really black and white. So, uh, I mean, people who told, okay, I mean, I don't like Putin, but I don't like Navalny either. Yeah, of course, Putin, Putin doing like um, some bad things, but this like Western values are not for us. That like liberal democracy is not for us. Like America is our enemy. The space for this school of thought, so to say, like springed or disappeared. Like because, because well, people have seen finally, unfortunately, too late, where bad governance and corruption and demolition of political institutions can bring. So and now they pretty much know that, well, either there are political institutions and it comes as a package deal with competitive elections, free press, and all other democratic things, or not. And then it comes to, well, enormous corruption. Um, please ask your question, introduce yourself. So working yep. all right 
So my name is Ethan Yang. I'm a senior at the Elliott School, graduating this spring. So it's my last semester here. So yeah. So thank you for coming, Ms. Mr. Volkov. Um, and thank you for coming as well, Mr. Green or Dr. Green, whatever. So and so like I have a couple questions for Mr. Volkov here. So like um so like you talk a lot about how like the majority of the Russian public doesn't actually seem to support the war from giving your own polling data. And, but and my question, and I actually have a couple questions. So never mind, I'll just move on. So so like I I, I guess I'll just advise then. So like you anyway, like never mind. So like basically like you talk a lot about how like we shouldn't buy into this myth, this notion that like Russia cannot be democratic, that it will always remain a threat to its neighbors. And from my own conversations with people from Central and Eastern Europe, like from Poland, Ukraine, the Baltics, they see that what you what you what you call this is seems to be very seems to be taken as fact by much of the by much of the political mainstream and defense mainstream there. So what what will you say in response to that? Like yeah. The the question is clear. Uh so first of all, I mean of course like the the the, the narrative about like a nation being unfit for democracy is just wrong by definition. I mean, we have two Koreas, we had two Germanys as a like living proof that it is just wrong. But it's also this narrative, which is indeed like taking off in some Eastern European countries, uh, is also very dangerous because it kind of like leaves no hope. If we cave to this narrative, if he admits that I mean, I mean, Russia is destined to remain like empire of evil, then how should we keep fighting? Uh, if after Putin, there might be only like a different Putin, a different version of him, someone unknown to us, maybe even worse. I mean, really, in 2023, talking about that some, something could be worse than Putin, but people still try to, to make this point. Uh, then okay, let, let's better deal, make a deal with this one. I mean, at least we are familiar with him, and like familiar is not so scary. And let's give him something, let's really do some concessions. Because, well, otherwise, I yeah, will keep fighting, more loss of lives, more economic uh, problems, and so on, like gas prices up, and so on. And at the end of the day, okay, even if this guy is defeated, there will be a new guy just like him. I mean, no one. And talk seriously about like just Russia seeking to exist. I mean, it has nuclear weapons and so on. So, on. so in this scenario, if we talk about like Russia being like destined to a dictatorship, we must like logically conclude that there is no uh, goal that we can achieve that is like worth all the uh, price that is being paid. And contrary to that. If he actually believes that Russia is capable for democratic transition, capable for freedom, then it makes sense like, to support Ukraine as strong as possible, to send as much um, like tanks and like and fighter jets and whatever uh, as possible, because then, well, a victory over Putin might at least like open window of opportunities to a better world with a better Russia when this country will not uh, be a threat. But also, we have evidence and data that supports my, my claims. Not only talking about like two Germanys or two Koreas, but also talking about, we can say, two Russians. Um, Alexei Navalny like, is being considered like a hero, mostly, like in the West, Western world. Like the guy survived the poisoning, uh, returned investigated the murder attempt against, against him, um, like now speaks up against the war despite being in jail and despite being tortured, like a real hero. 
right? Because of the great CNN documentary and because, well, well deserved. But this narrative actually misses one more important point that he is a hero, definitely, but not only a hero. He is like a political leader who built a large political organization which uh, who like won support of hundreds of thousands of people in Moscow during Moscow mayoral election, the last one when he was allowed to participate, to like put together like a lengthy and detailed political program for democratic transformation of Russia. And at the end of the day, we had like millions of supporters and political movement, which was perfectly capable of being in elections. It's not really, I mean, from, from, from our point of view, from 2023, like almost a year in this uh, horrible war, it's hard to imagine, but just two years ago, in just very ordinary Russian cities, like Novosibirsk and Tomsk, like in very ordinary districts among like those rundown high rises, candidates who've been labeled like members of Navalny organization, which is like enemies of the state, enemies of Putin, were running against members of Putin's party, United Russia, and won elections. Not not won like 10% or 5%, they won the majority of votes at their districts on a huge number of occasions. So it's like, for, for me, it says a lot. So we know that mm, we have like millions of people who want Russia to change. That like actually Alexei Navalny is polling better than Vladimir Putin among Russians under 35, which are well the people who will define the future of Russia. This generation for which uh, this like Cold War era mentality, uh, the this, this Soviet trauma, this Soviet like imperialistic approach that we have to care specifically about the countries of the ex-Soviet Union, well, this generation is now getting older and very naturally, um, it's it's getting replaced by, by by younger people who don't care for. For younger, we do this type of polling as well. Like for younger people, there is no difference between like Vilnius and Rome. This is two capitals of European countries. They they don't have any like special attitude uh, to Vilnius uh, compared to Rome. And I think they are perfectly capable of uh, having. A um, couple of questions on that uh, line of thinking coming in from, from Zoom. Uh, David Ensor uh, asks specifically about Navalny. First of all, do you know how he's doing? Um, and second of all, uh, what sorts of, of, of messages or instructions might be coming through if you can share them? Also, uh, on the same note, Sukhan Jimukov uh, here from, from George Washington uh, University asks um, whether you're able to share any, any plans for the movement looking ahead to 2024. 2024. Okay. Uh, we, we just published our plans for 2023. <laughs> just, I, mean, I think there's supposed to be an election. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> later, I, I realize why the question's been said, but I mean, it's it's indeed like flexibility has always been the key to our survival. Like, we've been a political party, a media organization, a body of investigative journalism. We were organizing rallies, we were organizing broadcasts, whatever. Like, this same group of people was able to do like very many different things, given the circumstances, like trying to find out what's the most painful thing to do against Putin is right now. And uh, I mean, 2024 is 11 months away and 11 months ago, the war has started. So we can't really be blamed for 2024. We can rely on our flexibility. But I'll, I'll, I'll address this question, of course, back to how Navalny is doing, he's not doing well. Uh, he's in a solitary confinement for five months now in a cell like eight by 11 feet. It has a uh, foldable bed that's being like folded against the wall from 6 a.m. to 10 p.m. So he can't take rest apart from this eight hours uh, in the night. And they put a psychologically unstable person to the next cell who cries through all the night, like very loudly. Uh, actually, like causing the, like a sleep deprivation for him, he's been stripped of his client during the privilege. And Russian prisons are not the place exactly where they care about human rights. But still, among three hundred sixty thousand Russian prison populations, there is only one person for whom the 
planet of the Roman privilege has officially been canceled. Um, doesn't exist for him, so he can't exchange any documents with his lawyers, uh, which is specifically remarkable because he will be actually put on trial in March for all that extra on these extremism charges, uh, which might result in a new sentence of like 30 years. Um, so all of this sounds bad, and it is bad, but from what we know and from what we see, when lawyers visit him, uh, when he gets his day in court and they can see him, his spirit remains strong. So they are definitely trying to break him, and they are definitely not succeeding in breaking him. <clears throat> but his health is endangered very much. Uh, that's 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 one of the reasons for this like large international free Navalny campaign that we've launched on January 17th and the second uh, anniversary of his arrest. I mean, uh, we are really afraid of the uh, deterioration of his health and uh, condition. Um, we are like before August last year, we actually like enjoyed. A, a good, like some 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 really good channels of communication with him. So we were able to discuss like political projects. I would tell him about like we are going to do this and that, and he was able like to approve or disapprove. Uh, since then, we are on our own. So we, all the newest anti-corruption foundations projects are already like decided by the uh, ACF's management, not by. Alexei Navalny, hopefully he will not punish us <laughs> when he gets out, or if he can. I mean, the most important thing is for him to get out. Um, and these are like our two large projects for 2023, the International Free Navalny Campaign and the uh, campaign where we connect with those people inside the country who want us to help them um, protest. So more than 20,000 people, enormous number actually, more than 20,000 people signed up when we announced, when we announced we'll launch a like secure communication platform uh, to, to, to support like local protesters. Uh, and once again, despite the risks they are facing, and we are now trying to like, help them organize in their cities to become visible in like urban environment, like posting leaflets, anti-war graffitis, uh, and so on. And hopefully soon this network will be also ready to do something more serious. They are still playing with it. As for 2024, indeed, Putin is up to re-election in March 2024. He will have to announce his candidacy uh, no later than in November this year. Or he will have to decide that he doesn't want to have an election. Mm, I believe that both options are not very good for him. Putinists are not monarchists. The vast majority of hardcore Putin supporters tend to believe they've elected him, they are part of the majority, he represents them, and they even have the illusion that if he does something wrong, they can vote him out of his office. The latest is not true, <laughs> they can't, but they have the solution and they like the idea that, well, Putin was elected and will be re-elected and so on. Uh, he will very much disconnect with his support base if he actually decides to postpone or to cancel the election. Even like they didn't uh, cancel the regional elections in uh, 2022, and I believe they will cancel the presidential. And this will become actually quite a trouble for them. They can't win anything. There is nothing they can achieve. They already have all the power, all the money, all the resources in the country. So it will be very naturally a stress for them because it's a negative sum game. So there is nothing they can win and there is something they can lose. Uh, Putin can't lose the actual election. He's of course like completely in control of those who count votes, but uh, if we'll be able to, uh, we didn't know what will be the circumstances in November. We didn't know what will be like the political atmosphere, the political temperature in March next year. But if the war will be continued till that point, 
This further defeats the Russian army. This further effect of economic sanctions. This uh, Putin's approval rating going like down more than now. Then this really will become a an enormous risk uh, for him and for for his and for Russia, uh, for everyone. Because well, of course we will try to make it like a pro-war, anti-war referendum rather than a like uh, re-election of Putin. And yeah. It will be difficult for him to. I mean, they can't read the actual results, but but people see what's happening. People talk to each other. People discuss like, whom did you vote for? Election is a very natural uh, uh, event when people connect and discuss their political views and positions. Because now there is like a small pro-Putin minority. Those people who like demand like to continue the war to kill more Ukrainians and so on. They have, they, they, their number is very limited. They are by far outnumbered by those who are against Putin. But both of these groups are by far outnumbered by, by, by those who kind of like are afraid to take position, are playing by the rules, are following the rules, are kind of like don't want to get involved in politics, all, all, all the crap. And they follow the majority. And what propaganda is doing? Propaganda is amplifying the message of this very small but very vocal minority. Propaganda is like beating down, uh, not letting get out like the message of the uh, anti-war, anti-Putin majority. So that this large majority of like people who are not very much into politics tend to believe that everyone around them is supporting the war, so they have to support it too. They don't like what's going on, but they feel that it's like socially acceptable, socially comfortable only to say they endorse it. So election is a very natural moment when people talk to each other, uh, try to learn what, what their like friends and relatives and so on actually think. And this might like really become very painful for Thank you. Um, what's your hands now? Let me go uh, to the first hand I saw was very back by the window. Hi, um, my name is uh, Sarah Clough. I am a program officer with Freedom House. Um, so I have several questions, but I'm going to be selfish and <laughs> ask the one that's really on my mind, um, not necessarily as a voice of, of Freedom House. Um, one of the questions that keeps that I keep coming back to throughout this conflict is what is reconstruction going to look like um, in, in Ukraine? That's a question that I have yet to receive a satisfactory answer to. Um, and I have not asked it in the Russian context. The relations between Eastern Europe, Ukraine and Russia and Russia and the rest of the world seem to be irreparable, even if there is a change in, in regime. There seems to be very little willingness to engage. What, what principles would guide um, reconstruction efforts? What does reconstruction look like to you? Um, I also hate to like bring this back to, to myself, but like, uh, and I, I'm not sure if the, the cultural connection here is going to connect, but, um, I'm half black. <laughs> my family is, my dad's family is from the South. I, I, my physical body is a representation of what happens when reconstruction goes wrong. And... So this, this lack of discussion about what reconstruction looks like is something very personal to me as a Black woman and also just as somebody who's involved in the region. Thank you. Uh, well, I don't believe that something could be 100% like irreparable because people change, generations change. And of course, well, it's matter more than words. Like for, for us, as a, like Russian political opposition, it's very obvious. We admit 
that uh, Russia as a country has caused like enormous damage to our neighbor. Well, while lives lost can't be returned, but like what has to be like reconstructed materially, like houses, hospitals, bridges, and so on, can be reconstructed. And there is like plenty of money uh, for it. So Russia will have to pay like reparations to necessary extent, and and Russia can afford this. As for the relations between like people and relations between like countries, well, of course, only time can heal. And yeah, practical steps. Well, as I put it, it's very obvious now that whoever will be like the next Russian president, his first foreign visit will be like to Kiev and to Bucha. That, that's that's quite clear. Uh, Russia will have to go through um, some kind of like well national reflection and purification, the Putinization. Like similar to what Germany uh, went through after the Second World War, it will be a painful process, of course, and there are many uh, issues that have to be resolved. Uh, but also, I would say there is a lot of wisdom now existing in this world with regard to transitional justice, in regard to actually how to deal with uh, such wounds. Unfortunately, it is not unprecedented uh, mm -hmm. what happened. Like, I mean, when I was at Yale in 2018, like taking, like uh, spending a semester there, uh, in, in, as a Yale World Fellow, there was uh, a guy, uh, a lawyer from Rwanda in my group who was dealing with like trans transitional justice in Rwanda for the uh, genocide. And like, I learned a lot from him. And there is, there are, there is a lot of knowledge like on our, like on the Anti-Corruption Foundation's uh, board. We have like Harold Bill, the former prime minister of Sweden, who is like well known for his uh, efforts in Bosnia and like dating agreements and so on. Well, we, we will have to study to learn and we'll have to do all this necessary homework. It will be painful, but uh, I can't agree it's irreparable or hopeless. Um, in, the, in the questions, I think over here, sorry, in the, in the second row. I don't remember the order I saw hands. I apologize. We will not get to everybody. We will not get to all the questions here. Um, but I'm ready. <laughs> I have been. So. Great. Thank you very much for this presentation. I'm a visiting scholar here at the Elliott School. Um, <laughs> I have two quick questions. Um, you mentioned, if I understood the survey question at the beginning, was about to what extent people believe the war was going well. Yes. And so I'm wondering if, I mean, is that the same thing as being opposed to the premise of the war, which is, you know, Putin's sort of propaganda about no, no. belonging to Russia, et cetera? Uh, it, it's, it's a different thing. And once again, we can't this ask we can't ask this question directly. So that, that's why we try to work around those indirect questions. You, you can't ask like, do you, do you, do you uh, well, do you agree with Putin or not? People will have to answer they agree, uh, but so their answers will not be meaningful. Right. Okay. Um, and my second question is, if you could talk, or if you think um, the way the war is going in Ukraine is going to impact what Russia is doing in Syria. If you could speak to that at all, I'd be, uh, I'd appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, thank you for this question. I'm definitely not a Syria expert. And uh, I, I think that actually they have very much reduced their efforts in Syria. To this extent, I mean, I know just because they are like fully concerned now with Ukraine. Um, I try to recall when I, like heard some Russia related Syrian news in the last 11 months, or I didn't like Wagner Group is not there anymore. They brought it to Ukraine, and everything else. Well, okay, I have to admit, I, I, I just probably don't possess enough like knowledge to address this question. Well, what I can say is that the Syria topic is now non existent in like Russian government media and their communications. So they it looks like they don't care at all about Syria anymore. Um, 
I want to follow up on uh, actually on the first question a little bit and, and pose some and summarize some questions that are coming through um, in, in the chat and picking up on some other things that have been mentioned here, um, which you know, is this question you touched on it a little bit in terms of the work that Russia is going to have to do and Russians are going to have to do um, uh, after this war is over and maybe before to reckon with, with what has happened. Um, and uh, again, uh, just too many questions to, to, to read, but, but to summarize, I think there's, there's a lot of concern about, um, as the previous uh, speaker was, was, was asking, not just uh, Russian support for the war itself and not just their support for Putin and whether they agree with him, um, but a certain willingness to accept ideas about Russia's place in the world, about what R Russia's relationship should be with some of its neighbors, um, about what relationships should be in terms of, of inter-ethnic relations within uh, Russia itself. These have always been difficult questions. These have been, and I, I, I know it's a difficult question to ask because these are, these are questions that um, you know, many in the opposition have, including in, in, in the Navalny campaigns, have not wanted to address head on. Um, but we're hearing increasing calls, again, from another number of the people here, from a number of, uh, of, of people around the world uh, for, uh, for clarity on this. I'm not asking for an answer to the question, um, but is, is this something that, um, uh, that you feel similarly optimistic about? Uh, and and what is the role that the Russian opposition should play in starting these conversations? Maybe, um, well, I, I'll try to keep my answer short, actually. Uh, and so it will be probably sound a little bit too simple uh, to, to simplify it, but it's very much a generation. So once again, we, we see like a very clear distinction between like, what people like under 40 who left all, all their life like after the Soviet Union and people over 40 tend to think about all these matters because uh, like for younger generation, uh, like the post-Soviet countries don't take a special place in their heart. It's like for older, yes. I mean, they went to Crimea, uh, for, for holidays and they were not able to comprehend why now Crimea is a foreign country and, 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 and so on, like something that, that Putin used very much to, to build his like Crimea uh, narrative in 2014. It, it, it was important, it mattered, but it, it matters less and less. This um, like uh, imperialistic narrative, well, Russia has to be a great power, we have to like rebuild uh, the glory of the Soviet Union, we have to exercise like control over our or the sphere of our geopolitical interests um, it's not something genuine it's a uh, artificial propaganda induced uh, construction why first of all because no one of those presenting it actually believes it. they are all like hypocrites I mean, they, they are not buying their own arguments, like Putin and all the people around them. Because of our anti-corruption investigations, we know them perfectly. They have families in the West, like properties in the West. The, their most important motivation is like to enormously enrich themselves. They might be like a couple of idiots that kind of like Patricia, maybe, that like actually read Dugin's books and think about like, oh, this is a good idea. But they are a marginal minority. Mount Russian, like the 95% of Russian elite thinks that, I mean, this imperialistic crap is a good thing to, to be broadcasted to, to the population, like to, to keep them entertained, like in a very Orwell way. Like let's feed this crap to, to the pros. And mm, they themselves, they are, they are not buying it and they, 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 they know this is crap. And so uh, people feel it, I mean, so this is something. This is something that they turned on at some point of time, like ten years ago. And if this turns, if it, if it's, it's if it's turned off, it ceases to exist. It's like I can compare. It's it's a uh, strange comparison, but I can compare it with uh, homophobia. Like Russia now is in a very homophobic country. 
yeah, you know, all this enormous anti LGBTQ plus laws passed and like really repressions against uh, like uh, members of the LGBT community. 20 years ago, the, the country sent tattoo to Eurovision. Yeah, the, the two girls pretending to be lesbians and like singing so songs about like how it's cool to be lesbian. Uh, it was 20 years ago. And then Putin decided that like for his, to, to achieve his political objective, it's, it's a good thing to invent an enemy and kind of like to channel the debates this way, like to, to, to channel like hatred against this enemy. It's been like entirely artificial and this so-called imperialism has, I believe, like the same nature. We have time, I'm looking for Marlene for instructions, but I think we have time for probably one or or, or two more. I think I saw your hand up. Um, good afternoon, my name is Alexander Moskalenko. I'm from the city of Kharkiv in Ukraine. Now I'm a visiting scholar here and a fellow in the Center for uh, um, European Policy Analysis. Well, um, I have, I think, one question a little bit bigger. So when um, Russians came to Kharkiv uh, with weapons uh, on the third day of the war, uh, we killed them all. We didn't have, uh, sorry, we didn't have the time to find out if they support Putin or don't, if they volunteered to come to the war or don't. So basically, we just killed them all. Uh, I think you will hear kind of similar stories from most people who were in Ukraine during the time, but somehow none of them would tell you that there was a Putin among, among these soldiers, right? So uh, when I was listening to you, I had some figures that I thought I should clarify. You said there is no, no one in Russia who volunteered to come to the war now, and you said that 95% or 99% of Russian elite is pro-Western. Uh, so my question is, like, who are these uh, hundreds and thousands of people who somehow came in Russian uniform to kill, to rape, to torture people in Ukraine? And if the war is for Russian money by Russian soldiers and by Russian weapon, who else war it is if it's not Russia? Thank you. Um, uh, your question is very understandable, as it is your uh, emotion. Uh, let me try to address it. Uh, first of all, uh, talking about, like, I mean, this, this is a very common, like, narrative. I mean, not Putin was coming to our houses, like, not Putin was shelling our houses, uh, but, like, normal Russians, like, uh, regular people, and we didn't know anything about their, like, Political views and so on. Sure. But uh, talking about like this collective responsibility, saying like all Russians are just enemies or like all Russians are uh, Nazis or something like this, which which we can read on like, Ukrainian social media, also in some Eastern European. In my opinion, it makes the quality of debate, of assessment, of uh, understanding what's actually happening worse rather than better. Uh, in this war, uh, we know a lot. There was there were like many uh, very well, uh, very detailed like, journalist investigations. We know very well who made the decision, how the decision was made, like who pulled the trigger. It was like literally Putin's personal decision to start the war. He conspired with it very, uh, he conspired with very few of his like uh, allies, like the prime minister of Russia, the head of, uh, head of the central bank, did know nothing about Putin's plan to invade before the invasion of February 24th starts. And of course, this helps us to distinguish between like degrees of responsibility. I'm not saying that like people who run Russia's economy are not responsible, they are, and that's why we, uh, suggest to, to punish them. We we come up with our sanction list that we, by the way, like put together do together with uh, Ukrainian anti-corruption bureau. Uh, but we have to distinguish also within like who made the key decisions, who is responsible more, who is responsible less, because it helps us to understand how to win the war, how to bring it to an end. 
100,000 Russian soldiers killed will not, unfortunately, end the war. One Putin killed, like, will, will end it immediately. Uh, like, immediately. And this is about, like, different degrees of, different levels of responsibility, different degrees of responsibility. Uh, volunteers. Well, this is just data. Uh, they tried to run many campaigns, like really trying to inspire people. You have to go, you have to protect the puzzle land. Like all this crap, like Ukraine voted, would invade, invade first if Putin would not. They didn't sell it. I mean, no lines, construction plans ever. And yes, like 300,000 people that they were able to mobilize in like October, people who have, well, nowhere to run. Uh, people who then don't have like a travel passport, don't know a foreign language, don't have any savings, have the only one job. People who kind of like, yes, decided to accept, decided to give up. They, if they call me, I'll go. I'll never volunteer, but if they call me, uh, I'll go because like I have nowhere to run. Are these people like bad? Uh, are they complying to like illegal orders? Are they uh, doing a bad thing like uh, going to Ukraine? Yes. Uh, what can we achieve? Not distinguishing between like their level of uh, guilt and responsibility and of those who give them these orders. Mm, I can't imagine. Uh, I, th I think it just doesn't help. Uh, it, does, it doesn't help to um, address the war. It doesn't help to, to bring it to an end. And talking about Russian elite, which is also very not uniform. For instance, the current um, Western sanction policy uh, doesn't work with the fact that the majority of the elite is Western oriented. And it's a bad thing. They kind of like, if, if you're now on like American, British, or European sanction list, there is the only way out, like Zhirinovsky did, you have to die. Then in a few months, you will be. Uh, removed from the sanction, which helps Russian elite to consolidate, which, which, which contributes to consolidation of Russian. I mean, they are, their assets are taken away, they, they can't anymore go to Europe, to London, so they can't educate their children in London, so they have to return to Moscow, and they feel kind of like in the same boat with Putin. But we know perfectly, they don't support it, they don't like it, they, they have a lot of, they are very afraid, they don't want to get like arrested, killed, or poisoned, uh, and so on. But uh, still, I mean, the current sanction policy is a one way road. What we suggest in this regard, keeping in mind their actual mindset, we say sanction, like all of them, much more than the current 1,200 sanction, we have like 7,000 things of, on our sanction list, but give them an option to get out of there. Yeah. Condemn the war, break up with Putin, leave the country, like donate your assets to uh, reparation, uh, to reconstruction of Ukraine, and then like get out of this. This will actually uh, efficiently address a significant part of Russian elite, and will make it for Putin like harder to maintain his efforts because his um, bureaucracy, his apparatus, will not be as efficient as it is unfortunately now. So I. I, I still believe that kind of like sober analysis and clear well, allocation of responsibility just helps to address the work in a more efficient manner. That's it. I think we're going to have to leave it there, unfortunately. There is a lot of work to be done, um, obviously, and a lot of very difficult conversations to have. But I think we've been able to start some of those conversations or continue some of those conversations. I'm sure that uh, George Washington and others will be very happy uh, to continue those conversations. So I will wish you uh, the best of luck and thanks.